Welcome back. Uh, lecture number two for week number two. Uh, and this one is going to focus a little bit more specifically on the Atlantic world. And we're going to talk about a colonialism process, which I think a lot of us in this class understand a bit better because it's at least somewhat covered in uh, your high school history classes or uh, in other global history classes that you have taken, you've probably looked at Atlantic colonialism a bit more closely than you have Indian Ocean world colonialism, because we all live in a country um, that is the product of Atlantic colonialism. The United States was, of course, at one point uh, a British colony, and I, and I work on um, colonial uh, America and the American Revolution. So, and we'll talk about the Age of Revolutions uh, shortly, um, but we'll talk about something that is definitely um, at least mentioned in uh, his high school history classes and other global history classes, but really needs to be highlighted even more closely because the Atlantic world and uh, the colonialization process that happened anywhere in the Americas, uh, its underlying component was always slavery. Uh, in, no matter where you were, in Massachusetts, Virginia, the Caribbean, uh, in Latin and South America, uh, all of these colonies were built on slave labor and uh, the subjugation of African people in the New World is a long-term ramification of the transatlantic slave process. So we're going to begin to outline transatlantic slavery in this lecture, and it's going to continue a bit more into lecture number three, where we'll talk a bit more specifically about the long-term ramifications of slavery and what does it mean to say that race is socially constructed but our question for this lecture is, what was transatlantic slavery? Just like we were asking, what was the Indian Ocean world? What was transatlantic slavery? And how did this form of slavery differ from other forms of slavery that existed in world history? I think it's a very common misconception when people say like, oh, transatlantic slavery was just another form of slavery. The Romans had slavery. The Greeks had slavery. You could even call feudalism in medieval uh, Europe a form of slavery. But transatlantic slavery was much, much different, especially because it was inherently built on two things. One, the idea of chattel, meaning that slaves were the property of owners, which is not necessarily true uh, for Rome or Greece, depending on where you are and when you are. Uh, and the second thing is that transatlantic slavery was inherently based on race, uh, and it helped create the idea of race that probably didn't exist prior to transatlantic slavery. So we have to talk about what made transatlantic slavery exceptional. It wasn't just a form of slavery that existed before. I have to rewind for a moment, because I didn't get to everything I wanted to do for the last lecture. It would be wrong for me to say that everywhere in the Indian Ocean world in the Pacific was colonization successful. Uh, and one of the most important examples of where colonization actually failed, European colonization, uh, is in Japan. European powers arrived in Japan uh, in the middle 1500s, and what they encountered was a group of warring, uh, very much tribal uh, people who were in uh, constant conflict with each other, kind of a large civil war. And you can see that map up there that kind of shows you these different families, these different uh, colonial warlords who uh, held control in different parts of Japan. And what the arrival of the Europeans did was aid specific families against others. They were in, able to enlist European power, uh, especially trade in goods, right? Think uh, firearms uh, and think different resources that one can mobilize for war in order to assert their control over other regions of Japan. And what this means by about a century later, right, during the 1600s, uh, Japan was unified under the control of a single military leader, often known as a shogun. Uh, and unlike other regions of um Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean world, the Japanese were actually able to force the Europeans out of, out of the islands of Japan. Uh, by 1650, basically all of the uh, European powers had been expelled from Japan. And actually Japan's going to close itself off from colonization and from interaction with the wider world for about 200 years. It's not until the 19th century when once again America steams in uh, to their ports that uh, Japan reopens. So the Japanese are actually able to expel um, any sort of foreign colonial powers uh, from their islands, much different than the Philippines or from uh, Southeast Asia or even India, which isn't able to do it to the British until the 20th century. And actually this expulsion is rather, uh, rather brutal, <laughs> definitely not beautiful. Uh, if any of you have seen the movie, I think it was two or three years ago, released Silence about uh, the Catholic Jesuit missionaries who were expelled very violently or killed. 
from Japan. I've got a link here uh, that you can click in the PowerPoint PDFs if you want to read a little bit about that expulsion. And so what you have is in Indian Ocean world, and this is where I want to leave us off in the Indian Ocean world, by 1850 that looks like this. You'll notice all of, all of the Indian Ocean world in Southeast Asia has been colonized um, by the Europeans. So this is what uh, the Indian Ocean world will look like by 1850. But let's transition now to the Atlantic world. So you can see this map here, right? We're focusing most specifically on the Americas and also the west coast of Africa. Um, the Atlantic world is a connection, and you can read about this in the chapter. There's that whole segment about what is the Atlantic world, and um, one of my major fields that I study is the Atlantic world. Now, some people say it don't exist, and that it is a, um, a uh, creation of historical thought, but there's definitely evidence to show that the Americas, Europe, and the west coast of Africa during, uh, after 1492, after Columbus's voyage, straight through uh, the Second World War, were intimately connected in a process uh, of, of engagement, of trade, uh, of the circulation of ideas and people. That means that they're all interconnected, right? We can't study colonial America without studying the West Coast of Africa and Europe. In the same sense, we can't study the West Coast of Africa without studying the Americas and the slave trade, which also brings us back to Europe. So this is the Atlantic world, right? This interconnected uh, process of development that inherently and intimately linked the Americas with the West Coast of Africa uh, with Europe. And like I said, perhaps nowhere is this connection more obvious than when we talk about the transatlantic slave trade. And so this map comes directly from your textbook and it demonstrates to you a, a little bit about where um, enslaved Africans were taken from and where they were brought to. Now you'll notice that these arrow sizes represent kind of the most significant movement of population. I'd actually argue with this map a little bit. Uh, if you look at the regions of destination, these, these areas shaded in purple, um, absolutely the Caribbean was the most uh, kind of largest landing point for enslaved Africans, followed closely uh, by Brazil. But then when you look at kind of North America and Central America, it's giving you the idea that only some regions of this uh, were um, the destination for um, enslaved Africans. But that's not true. Actually, I spent a lot of time studying in Newport, Rhode Island. Newport, Rhode Island was one of the largest um, slave trading centers on the East Coast, especially in the North. And you'll notice that that is not covered in that uh, purple region. There were also enslaved people brought as far North as Newfoundland and Canada and Nova Scotia. And so this map doesn't even do it uh, real uh, justice. That kind of purple area should be much, much larger. Um, but this transatlantic process is really kind of where you can see uh, the most obvious um, uh, existence of this Atlantic world, right? Slaves brought from Africa to the Americas and some, as you note, even back to Europe. Uh, and you'll also notice something about the slave trade that isn't necessarily taught in American classrooms uh, either. It began uh, right around 1500, right? Shortly after Columbus's voyage. But that doesn't mean that it was... Um, as uh, big a process as it was at different periods in time. And so you can see from this map, which also comes uh, from your textbook, that the uh, transatlantic slave trade is going to grow slowly and only really reach its height at the turn of the 19th century. You know, people think of slavery as being something that, oh, that happened in the 15, 1600s. But no, it actually didn't reach its height. The height of the transatlantic slave trade wasn't until 1800, and you'll notice that, you know, even though the U.S. bans uh, the trade of international slaves shortly after the 19th century, right, in the early 1800s, the slave trade continues straight through 1866, which is the abolition uh, of slavery in most of the Caribbean and in uh, uh, South America. But, you know, the slave trade continues uh, well into the 19th century, you know, to think about the fact that uh, slaves were being traded as late as the late 19th century, so, you know, only a little bit more uh, than 120 years ago is uh, something to really kind of shake the foundation of what we understand about slavery. And as you can see here, another thing that's kind of commonly misunderstood about slavery is that only about 3.6, right? Uh, still a huge number of people, right? Uh, more than 300,000, almost 400,000 people um, uh, were brought to mainland North America. But when we talk about where did most of the enslaved people uh, land, you'll notice here Brazil and the Caribbean, each owning about uh, 5 million people uh, traded between the late uh, 15th century and the late 19th century. Uh, a massive number uh, of people imported mostly to the Caribbean uh, and to Brazil. And another thing that's not necessarily studied enough in American classrooms is that the importation or the capture of slaves in Africa happened 
uh, in different places at different times and with different results, right? Some regions of Africa were affected much more uh, by the capture of slaves than others. Two in particular regions that were really affected by uh, the trade of slaves was the Bight of Benin and the Bight of Biafra. Uh, and the Gold Coast, right? These regions on the west coast of Africa, where you can kind of see the arm turn on Africa, um, were heavily affected uh, by the slave trade from the beginning of it straight through the end. So much so that, you know, towards the later 18th and 19th centuries, um, the local populations of the west coast of Africa were totally decimated, meaning that slave capturers uh, had to travel further and further into Africa, meaning that even Central and West Africa were affected by the slave trade, right? Because as populations were captured from the interior and brought to the coast, uh, interior Africa was uh, affected as well. So what does this mean? What's the long story short here? More than 12 and a half million men, women, and children were brought from Africa, captured, and brought to uh, the New World. The overwhelming number of these people landed in the Caribbean and South America. And there's a phenomenal database that's created out of Emory University where you can actually track um, the movement of slave populations uh, and slave traders through the Atlantic. And so you can click this link in our PDFs if you want to play with this slave trade database a bit more. Um, but you can see how um, slave traders operated between Africa, the Caribbean, uh, and North America. And what's their purpose, right? This is what differentiates the Atlantic world so much from the Indian Ocean world. Where the Indian Ocean world was created to be a trading post empire, the New World was largely a plantation empire. Important products like sugar, coffee, eventually cotton, earlier tobacco, uh, indigo, rice, all of these products were created on plantations, meaning that in order to properly plant, maintain, harvest, and refine these products, you needed a tremendous amount of labor. And the European nations did not have the labor force needed to uh, successfully harvest these products. And in particular, Northern Europeans were not suited for the tropical climates in which most of these products were grown. Uh, and so Europeans looked very early on to Africa in order to ensure that their products could be uh, harvested. And we'll talk about why this is in, in just a moment. But this labor force is what differentiates the Atlantic world from the Indian Ocean world uh, so completely. And as we'll talk about in the third lecture, Europeans also needed to invent a reason for keeping these people enslaved, right? Europeans were not, um, uh, I guess, dumb to the idea that slavery was probably immoral. So they needed to create justifications for, okay, well, why can we do it? And we talk about those uh, in just a minute and a bit more in the third lecture. And it's important to note that Atlantic slavery was much different than any other form of slavery that existed prior to 1492. Right, a lot of people say, oh, the Romans or the Greeks had slaves, or uh, in the Middle East, there was an enslavement process too. And this is absolutely true. Uh, enslaved Romans made up a significant portion of the population. But importantly, the idea of slavery in Rome or Greece, or even in the Islamic world uh, through the 18th century had nothing to do with race. Uh, in Rome, for example, you could be enslaved if you were a conquered person, white, black, it, it didn't matter. Conquered people, uh, especially Gauls, so people from uh, what is now France and Germany, these were the slaves uh, in, in Rome. And uh, it had nothing to do with skin tone or skin color. In fact, there's evidence that perhaps the Romans didn't even really pay any attention to skin, skin color because it varied so tremendously across um, the uh, European continent that they owned. But if you look here, I've got three images, so I want you to pause and really kind of read these questions. If you see this artist's rendition of the slave trade, you'll notice here that the artist paints these enslaved people uh, as kind of inferior, right? These Africans, they seem happy in enslavement. They're kind of almost fit for slavery. This pays into the idea that they were kind of created for subjugation, this horrible idea about uh, how people could be uh, inferior. And you'll notice in this image, uh, the artist is clearly trying to demonstrate that it wasn't Europeans who were responsible for slavery. In fact, Africans sold other Africans into slavery. So the real blame, they think, should have been placed on, on Africans. And in a critical thinking exercise here, I'm asking you to kind of take a look at, at what they thought would happen if abolition was increased. And you'll notice here that Europeans were afraid of abolition because they were afraid it would upend this sort of order. 
So I'm not saying anything that any of this is just. In fact, I'm going to say quite the opposite. This is entirely unjust. So we're going to come back to these images in our third lecture.